stopped the majority of our distributions early in 2020, just because of uncertainty. We're like, wait a minute here, we wanna make sure we have sufficient cash to be able to make the best long-term decision for these assets. So, hey, this quarter we're gonna hold. It doesn't mean the performance of the deal has changed, but we had to really overly communicate as to how things were going. I wanna believe people are out there doing their fiduciary responsibilities and acting in good faith, and they're trying to make properties better and homes better for people. That was Dave Codre of Greenleaf Management. We got into some really interesting discussions about what you should be doing right now and why you might see distributions pause and also different asset classes and what he's excited about in the marketplace today. So stay tuned. This is a great episode. The limited partner shares in the potentially outsized returns of a well-planned and executed investment, but as a passive investor and has the maximum leverage on their most precious asset, their time. And that is why we're here together. 90% of the millionaires out there built their net worth with real estate. However, 0% of the billionaires are hands-on managing the real estate assets because there simply isn't enough time. My name is Jake Wiley, and for the past 16 years, I've been investing in real estate, and I've learned a thing or two. But the most important lesson is how to leverage the expertise and time of others to maximize your investment potential. Welcome to the Limited Partner Podcast. All right, welcome, partners. We're back again. This week, I'm joined by Dave Codre of Greenleaf Management. Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jake. Excited to talk today and go through some of the investment knowledge here. This is good stuff. Yeah. I'm excited to hear what you've got to share. I've got a little bit of a sneak preview ahead of the show. So this is going to be a good one, you guys. So stay tuned. But Dave, for the benefit of my audience that hasn't had a chance to meet you yet or hear you on any other podcast, why don't you give us a little bit of backstory of how you got started and how Greenleaf came to be? Yeah, I got started, I would say, pretty early. I mean, I started looking at real estate deals basically out of high school. But it's when I was doing it, it was... What is what way can I go actually earn some other passive income? And I had read some books on it. I was pretty handy, so I could buy some cheap townhomes, renovate them, and rent them out. And I did that for quite a few years. Of basically, I had some other small partners that we were doing stuff with, and it worked really well. Especially when I was in my early twenties, I was able to save some money and keep buying real estate. I just kept that trend going over the past twenty years, and have gone from individual townhomes into bigger apartment buildings and commercial assets and that kind of stuff. But it's taken a long time over the years and a good amount of hard work to go turn things around. I've always been attracted to value add opportunities where you can take something messy and turn it into something nice. So that is predominantly what I've done really over the past 20 years, building out my real estate portfolio. That's an interesting, I guess the start, right? You said a word that always kind of makes me smile, especially when you're getting into single family or flip type stuff. As you said, you read some books or you got into it because you were looking for some passive income. Did you find that it was actually passive income? No, I have not. Well, when I invest in other people's investment deals, that's more passive. That's good. But no, the stuff that I've done my whole career has been exceedingly active. So I've always been the started as the maintenance guy. I've been doing property management. We still do property management to this day. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes of any real estate deal to make it perform. It's not passive on the general partner side. That's for sure. Especially if you are, we operate, we're the management company as well. So there's always something going on. Yeah. I think a lot of us out there that are learning about the whole limited partner journey, you do read books and you're like, Hey, real estate is passive. It's this property and it works and like tenants live there and then they pay you. And then I think it probably find very quickly that like, even if you've just got a couple of rental properties, it's anything but passive and it's definitely not convenient, right? Like people never call you, the air conditioner never goes out on a mild day. <laughs> <laughs> the the right. roof never, yeah. me- never leaks when it's sunny, right? <laughs> some people you get into real estate and you're like, at some point, if you have a day job or a career that you're starting with and you're going to transition into it. Sometimes it's more like, hey, I don't have time to do both. You got to pick one. So in my in my case, it was like, eventually I got to the point I couldn't do both. I, and I picked real estate. I love doing it. It's what I've wanted to do. I'm excited to do that, but it's a lot of time. Yeah, it is. It is a lot of time. And I think that as we think about the limited partner journey, right? The idea is to truly be passive, right? You're not the operating partner. You're not the GP. You're the limited partner. You're putting your money in and, and you're working. But you know, you've done both. Right. So you've been a sponsor, you've syndicated deals, you've also put money into deals with some other folks. But thinking about it from the limited partner seat, 
I'd love to hear, let's humanize you a little bit for the audience because it's not all rainbows and sunshine. Tell me about some mistakes that you've made and maybe how you've been saved. I think mistakes are the biggest ones looking at an investment and once you've made that investment, changing what your expected investment outcome is. Like to me, it's not necessarily a mistake that you made, but it's a mental hurdle that you've got to get through of saying, look, I invested in this deal. These are the risks that I knew. This was my hopeful outcome from that. But then as that deal goes on and on, you kind of change your viewpoint of what your expectations are. So I think it's important to understand what you what your original goal was when you invested, why you made that investment, what you were thinking at the time, so that you can, one, go back and assess your own investment decisions, but then really base your performance on what you expected to happen at that time. I think when you lose sight of that sometimes, but you expect a deal to do better or you didn't see this coming, but a lot of times you kind of knew some of these risks ahead of time and then forgot about them over time. Well, let's get specific then. It sounds like you've got some personal experience there. And I think we all do, right? We're like, the downside is this, but I really expect it to be like way up here, but done that personally. Yeah. And then, and I guess one, have there been any yeah. that have, have gone the other way? Oh, certainly. It's it, not everything. There's a reason you rank your deals between this is the best one and this is the worst one, mm -hmm. right? And all of the hurdles that we face, and we've got some right now that are where it's taking longer to get occupied than we had originally planned. So we've got, we've had that happen in mobile homes, right? Where you've got mobile home parks, where you're trying to rent out units and you're trying to turn a mobile home that's in, you buy a deal, it's value add. It takes a lot of work to turn a mobile home. They've got very specific type of maintenance needs. So we've had mobile home parks where it took us twice as long to get the occupancy that we were projecting. That puts you behind on distributions. You've got a little bit of fatigue with your team because they're like, man, this capital project is taking twice as long as we thought it would. And you're dealing with not only financial issues from that, but morale issues for how do you get through this project and, and make sure you get to the finish line. So that's something I think missing on CapEx time forecast, not so much the cost, but the time that it takes to go execute stuff. That really got exacerbated during COVID when lead times for any materials were kind of like an unknown, right? We're doing an office building right now where we have tenants, but it's going to take us almost eight months to get a, one of these large HVAC systems in place. And that's a long time, eight months to wait for materials. We still haven't received it yet. So we're optimistic, but we still haven't received it yet. You're sitting there, you're like, hey, is this going to happen on time or not? So those hurdles that we knew it was an unknown, like I said, we knew this was a risk, so we're not totally surprised by it, but man, in the middle of it, that sucks. It's not a fun one to be dealing with. So. Yeah. I mean, if we go back in time, let's call it two years when the market was, everything was still kind of rising, the market can save you at times, right? Now that's some of the beauty of real estate is that some of these things you can muddle through. And I know from my personal, like hands-on experience that there are times where Yes, things cost more, it took longer, all of the things kind of added up. But at the end of the day, like still made out like a, a bandit because the market in general was rising, but we're not in that place anymore. So I think from a limited partner perspective, what's your advice for a limited partner that's looking at a deal right now to put money to work? Yeah, I think you really have to understand how the deal is going to be operated, who's going to be doing the operating component of it, because that's really what's driving the success of that deal. And I mean, there are great property management groups out there that don't do the syndication. There are some that are vertically integrated like we are, where we're doing syndication and management, but you need to understand what that management team's track record is, how they operate and what's kind of like their unique ability to perform on a deal, whether it's they're great in one geography or they're great with either expense control or they are great growing revenue. And how does that management team's experience play into the business plan associated with the deal. And I guess what questions would you ask specifically, right? If you're looking at a deal, working with your sponsor, maybe they're not vertically integrated and they're talking to somebody like, what would you ask? Well, I think it boils down to the type of investment opportunity out there that you're investing in. And we normally look at that from the standpoint of there's physical ad properties where you've got to make physical improvements to it. And there's operational value add properties where the asset may be fine, but you either need to go aggressively do some leasing or you need to do aggressive cost control to get things 
working out. And those require different management approach. So if it is a capital improvement project, I want to know, hey, who is the CapEx manager going to be on this asset? What's their experience? How have they been able to get these types of projects done before? And track record isn't the only thing you're looking at. You want to know hey, how many projects are they working on at this time? You can only do so many things. You can only focus on so many things at one time. If it's a operational improvement deal where you're saying, hey, we're going to go and we're just going to raise revenues here. It's like, okay, how are we going to plan to do that? What leasing structure are we going to use? What does your leasing team look like? Have they done this before on other assets? And how are they going to get compensated for performing that work? Because you want to make sure the management team and the execution people are getting compensated directly tied to how the business plan is built out. That's your best chance for success, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think you brought up some really good points earlier, too, about lead times and the processes that maybe in the past you could look at a deal and it'd say, hey, this is what it's going to cost. And this is, we've priced out all the materials. We know what the labor is, but there's opportunity cost in there as well. And as you think about if you want to raise rents because you're doing these improvements and all these things kind of play together to make the model work, were you asking about the lead times? Are you trying to figure out like, okay, well, hey, look, this is rather mostly cosmetic. It's not that big of a deal. Or if like in this case, you've got significant capital assets that you're trying to bring that are a linchpin to a piece of this. Or is that something yeah. they should be specifically asking about? Yes. I mean, certainly if you look at, you're digging into kind of the financial analysis component of any investment. When you look at a business plan, it's going to outline how long is this turnover going to take? How long is the turnaround process going to be? I think you're breaking that into buckets of the physical improvements that are needed. Like how many units or how many square feet can you renovate in a month or two months or three months? And then what is the time for market absorption to lease? If it's a multifamily, how fast can you lease those units? There's only so many units you can physically lease in a month. And then ultimately time to stabilize. Like they've got to be able to get in. Even once you lease a unit, you're still, they've got to move in. They've got time to get fully into that unit, start paying their full rents, that kind of stuff. So you add all those times together and it's not a, we're going to turn this unit in a week and it will rent it next week and it's going to be great. It's that's It doesn't happen like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a great point too, right? Because if you think about the market and a lot of the news, especially even still today, there's a lot of news that rents are still going up or they're not coming down. And there's a lot of instances where maybe you found a unit that's under market, right? That's the value add play. But you know, how fast can you do that, right? Because if you're saying, hey, look, we've got 100 units and they're all 20% under value, like you're not going to be able to swap out all 100, all 100 units and get them up to market rents within a year. Like that's going to take some time. Yeah. I think when you're looking at just supply and demand stuff, as prices and rents keep going up, people are going to take longer to make that decision to go pay 20, 30, 40% more. So leasing times are going to take longer. We're seeing that across our multifamily portfolio where yes, rents are still going up, but the time to lease units is also growing significantly on a percentage basis compared to six months ago, where six months ago, you could lease something almost instantly. Now, it takes a little bit of time. If it takes two or three weeks, that's a lot longer than it was six months ago because prices have gone up and people aren't just going to automatically just pay more because you're asking for it. They're going to take time and make a financial decision for their family as they should. It's going to take them longer to make that leasing decision. Yeah, I would definitely echo the sentiment that the scare, the feeling of scarcity that we had go back a year has dissipated, right? I mean, it's still there, right? And the market demand is there. There's still housing pressures. But that sense of like, if I don't take this right now, I'm going to miss it. People are saying, well, hold on. Like, if I don't, if I don't have to make an urgent decision, like I don't feel like I have to make those decisions right now like I used to. And to your point, like all of those like delays or expansion of time in the decision making process adds up cumulatively. So if you're looking at projections, even like timelines that were in financial models or forecasts six months ago are kind of irrelevant at this point. Like you need to look at it and say, like, if, are you seeing a difference, right? And how are those things being factored in? Did I capture that right? Yeah, no, that's exactly spot on. I mean, it, that's a lot of what we're dealing with across all of our asset classes right now. And that's kind of what's out in the market. 
there's kind of like that investor mindset of sometimes the best deals are the deals you don't do, but that applies to anything. Sometimes, hey, I'm not going to go pay a bunch more rent. I'll just stay in the place that I'm at. And for a lot of people, that's probably a good decision as you're facing a more uncertain economy. Whether that's true or not, if the feeling is that, people are going to make more conservative decisions. Yeah, I think the feeling is definitely trending that way, for sure. Let's talk about what is your advice? Folks have gotten into deals recently, and maybe these business plans are taking longer to develop. What's your advice for them, right? We could be talking about distributions that have dried up, right? The potential of a capital yeah. call. What do you? What's your advice there? I, looking at those situations, it's why did I get into that deal in the first place? Like, did I make an investment because I wanted to get recurring distributions? Or did I make an investment because there's a big capital gain opportunity here? Typically, those don't go hand in hand. Those are normally different types of deals. So if you invested because you thought you were going to have a big capital gain and they're like, well, hey, now I want distributions, kind of changed your investment mindset in that process. So that's really like sticking with what was your original reason to get in this deal? And if you don't see the opportunity for that investment decision to play out, then you really need to just look into what's causing that to happen. So if it was a distribution deal and you're not getting distributions anymore, it's like, what has <laughs> caused of that? And how does that shape my future investment decisions? Right now, operating costs are growing fairly rapidly across the board. Taxes and insurance are in some markets, especially coastal areas are way higher on a growth rate than people I think would have projected. So you're seeing definite challenges in that, and that's blown apart some syndication models as well, where maybe you didn't expect insurance to double. So I think making sure why you made that investment and looking at what the causes are that are impacting your investment results so you can avoid that decision next time. Yeah, that's a really relevant point. I know you're like tying it back to something you were mentioning before, but when you think about the investment, right, a lot of these investments are kind of pitched as like, hey, look, there's monthly, quarterly, whatever distributions that are coming out at a preferred amount. And then in the back end, our projection is like, here's the market rate now, like this is where we expect it to be. And probably in most instances, folks are investing for the long play, right? Like the expectation is like, I'm excited about where this thing is gonna end, not where it is next month. However, if next month you pull the distribution, you're all of a sudden thinking, well, wait a minute, like maybe this whole thing is gonna unravel, right? And like that's Right. That's the way we work as humans, right? Like we assume the worst, but may maybe it's not the worst case scenario. It's like, hey, look, things are taking a few minutes longer than we thought it was going to get the occupancy up or like this big capital development. We're waiting on this HVAC unit. Like all of these things are fine in the grand scheme of things. It's probably just a function of communication. What do you think about right. that? Yeah. I mean, the communication from the general partner or the syndicator of why they're making decisions that's important. I go back to 2020, we stopped the majority of our distributions early in 2020, just because of uncertainty. We're like, wait a minute here. We want to make sure we have sufficient cash to be able to make the best long-term decision for these assets. So, Hey, this quarter we're going to, we're going to hold. It doesn't mean the performance of the deal has changed, but we had to really overly communicate as to how things were going. So sometimes if a deal isn't going to make a distribution, Yes, your immediate thought is, wow, this thing is, it's over. The deal's done. It's, everything's terrible. It's like, well, look into what that decision is. Maybe, maybe they're taking current cash and they're reinvesting it into unit terms because they were more expensive, but they are leasing them. They are turning them. They're just using that cash to reinvest into the property. And a lot of times I, I want to believe people out there doing their fiduciary responsibilities and acting in good faith and they're trying to make properties better and homes better for people. So if distributions have stopped on a deal, it's like, look at where that money's, look at where that money's going. Is it going to reinvesting in the property or is it going to just expense creep or tax growth or one of those kind of things? Yeah. I, th I mean, I think that's a really great point too, is that yes, if the distributions have stopped, the question is what's happening with the money? right? Like the rents are theoretically still coming in, where are they going? And if you're saying, hey, look, we're just putting a little bit of a reserve over here. The market's uncertain. Like 
nothing's really changed fundamentally about this operation, but like we expect some of these things they are taking a little bit longer. I think those are all fine reasons, right? If they're reasonable, right? And I think you can get a sense of that. But if to your point, it's like, hey, we're just covering overhead with like this cash, then you might be like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> that might not, might not be a great place for this money to be going. And then evaluating what your position is in that. I mean, look, you're in it, but like, are you going to put more money in that deal? Like th there are times where it actually makes a capital call makes sense, right? And it's actually gonna improve the deal because there's opportunity to like maybe do something faster than you originally thought because of market pressures. Like, But I think that the sponsor, the general partner needs to be very forthcoming and very transparent about what's happening. And then probably more so today, like even on the front end, before the deal is even closed and the, the original capital calls made, like this is how we operate. Like in these instances, we may pause distributions, right? And like, we will let you know when that happens. And the reason we would do that is because X, Y, and Z. And then if that ends up happening along the course of the deal, then you're kind of prepared for it. And you're like, oh, okay, like this is not a, an emergency. And I think that what it seems like probably today in a lot of situations, and frankly, in a lot of situations, it could be an emergency, right? <laughs> but it could seem like it because you don't know, right? But like, how many people really want monthly distributions when they're thinking like, really, I'm excited about the big gain at the end here. Right. Yeah. And a situation similar to that is we've got a, we have an apartment deal that we're planning to do a renovation on in about two years. And the reason we're planning that far out or why we don't just do it right now is it has, it's a tax credit deal. So it has rent restrictions in place, but eventually they do expire. And at that time, we can make some pretty significant improvements to the asset. We could realize market rents, but the deal doesn't just make enough cash flow out of the gates to go pay for all those renovations. So we're working on that right now with our investment group in that one and saying, hey, do we want to continue distributions? And then in two-year timeframe, we either have to contribute or we have to get an additional loan to go finance these improvements we want to do, or do we want to stop improvements and save up money to that CapEx over time, you, know, you got two different investment scenarios there. And we've been explaining these examples with our investment pool for a while now as we prepare for that and really looking at the numbers to see what makes the best financial sense here, both from a deployment of capital standpoint and a managing the operations of the asset standpoint. And that decision together, our investors get in a good idea of how we make decisions, why we make them and where their money's going. So I think anyone that's that's looking at like, hey, we're going to stop a distribution, like what is going to happen with that money? What are we doing with it? And what's the plan? Yeah. And I think getting comfortable with that, like I said, there, we both said there's great reasons for it. And then there's some not great reasons and you need to determine which one you're at. But, you know, most folks left to their own imagination will assume the worst. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's communication standpoint from, from the syndicator or from the general partner of letting all those investors know, Hey, this is how we make decisions. This is our beliefs and the values we operate on. So that's kind of always got to be reinforced people. You know, if you're left, I think that's human nature. You kind of assume yeah. the worst. If you're getting no information, you're just assume, Hey, worst case scenario, right? Human nature cool. of doing that. Let's let's change gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about multifamily, a very small amount about mobile homes, but what is your take on other asset classes? What are you looking at? What's interesting to you? What do you think is voting well for the market right now? Right now, we're pretty bullish on the retail side and on the industrial flex side. And we kind of have our own definitions of what that looks like. On the flex side, we it's basically a single story older generation building with some roll up doors and one to really three, maybe 5,000 square foot bays. That's a lot of home service companies that are there. So everything from an HVAC company to pest control, we have a lot of those types of operators that are in that space and it's performing really well. And we're seeing good demand there. The other segment, we really like single tenant net lease deals. They perform consistently. You have pretty good credit that's behind them. And as long as you have the right operators and the right brand, we've seen great returns in those markets right now. So we're focused on those two things right now, but I am overall, I'm pretty excited about what's happening in the office market right now. I mean, I know it's getting a bad rap. People are like, oh, office is like a four letter word right now, 
But I think America is a pretty innovative space. And I think a lot of these office buildings that are underutilized or misused right now, we're going to see some exciting stuff happen with them. So I, we're not doing any office conversion stuff right now, but I'm very excited to see where that stuff heads and kind of see how we can get in and, and into that space too. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, it's really interesting because it, there's one piece of it where there's numbers that are thrown around that 30, 40% of the office space, existing office space in the U S is now functionally obsolete, right? Like it'll never be office again, which is a very big number in the grand scheme of things. And then you factor in the fact that office was generally the highest price asset class of all like the commercial real estate, right? It used to be the darling of institutional funds. Like that's where the money went because they were three, five, 10 year leases and offices. And now we're in a situation where we know that 30, 40% of this stuff is going to have to be something else at some point in the future. And I think that there is a significant impact to the real estate market as those prices have to get adjusted to comp to make the conversion, whatever conversion to make sense. What are your thoughts on, I guess, this transition period? Yeah, I mean, that math certainly has to change for it to be able to use as some other kind of space. But even down here in Atlanta, there was a, there's a mall deal on the east side and mall's not office, right? But it was a kind of defunct mall space that one of the large healthcare providers here took over and converted a huge amount of space to for their back office and their support staff. And again, they moved it into office. They did this probably two, three years ago. It, it happened, but they're still using that space. It was a good example of a conversion. I know New York City's got a bunch that they're kind of trying to push through these office to apartment conversions. And New York City kind of leading the charge on that kind of stuff is it'll be exciting to see what they come up with. But pricing has to change certainly on that square footage to, uh, to make these kind of deals happen. But office, for the most part, you've got pretty big buildings. You've got open floor plans. You can be creative and get something done in them. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, and to your point of like what's exciting about this is that you, we will see in our lifetime a significant change to the commercial real estate landscape and the way things look. Like skylines will change, like uses will change, where people live is going to change drastically. And without the pandemic, like this never really would have happened or it would have happened over a much longer period of time. And I think we're going to see, we're going to get to live through something that's pretty, pretty significant. So it'll be fun from that aspect. I think that the pricing adjustments that are going to have to come through and then where those live was going to be really interesting. Yeah. I mean, this stuff has happened before though. And if you look at all the kind of old mills that have been converted to apartments, you're talking about something that was a productive manufacturing facility that then went vacant for a few years. And then it got converted into what are now like very expensive apartments or very expensive mixed use developments, even Pond City Market here in Atlanta. I mean, it's a huge redevelopment of an area that was something completely different. And it's fantastic. And people love being there. They love seeing that stuff. So also this kind of just the next wave of what are we going to do with some of these spaces that need to be converted in that manner? It's a little scary up front because you're thinking about it, but it's going to be pretty neat as that transition occurs. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Well, Dave, this has been an awesome conversation. I like to end every episode with a little bit of gratitude. because Somebody gave you a little bit of a, an opportunity maybe you didn't quite deserve or helped you out along the way. I want to give you a platform publicly to say thank you. Yeah, certainly. When I first here in Atlanta, coming from the Northeast, I didn't really know anyone. And I got in touch with a guy here Scott Akers, and he introduced me to Bo Brown, which is a broker down here with Brown Realty. And they have been, to this day, over a 10-year relationship, some of my very best and first deals. They kind of stuck their neck out and said, hey, we'll give Dave and his business partners and Josh and Greenleaf an opportunity here to execute and prove that they can do something. And it's been phenomenal over the past decade working with them. And his sons are in the business, and we're, uh, we're selling an apartment deal with them right now. And it's been fantastic, but they were a huge part of our success early on in, in getting our foot in the door. And I mean, we, we snuck a toe in the door and they let us, they allowed us to keep it there. So we grew from that, which is very thankful for. That's a, that's an awesome story. I hope they're, they listen to the show and get that, but I'm sure you've told them along the way. Well, Dave, yeah. thank you so much for being on the limited partner podcast. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Enjoyed talking. 
hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and I'd actually love for you to contribute to a future episode. If you have a question you'd like answered or a topic or a guest to bring on the show, please email me at jake at thelimitedpartner.com. Now I realize there's a lot of lingo that's thrown around on these shows, so I've created a cheat sheet for you with the top 26 terms that come up most often. Head on over to thelimitedpartner.com forward slash lingo for the list. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.